And now Renard of the Second in a special series of celebration devoted to the Boddington's Manchester Festival of Arts and Television coming up in September. Tonight, a 24-hour drive around Manchester, the clubs, the music and the people. <laughs> In the can. I'm John Savage. Although I'm a Londoner, I love this city. It's my second home. I lived here for several years in the late 70s. When I lived here, the music was doomy and the city was a mess. Now the music has changed and the city has changed. I want to find out why the music comes out of the city in the way that it does and how that music has changed the city. The idea is to drive around the city for 24 hours to find out what Manchester's like now. First stop is Hume, that mid-60s attempt at social engineering now being torn down and rebuilt. During the last ten years, its dereliction has provided a home for musicians, students, artists. As our first guide, John Robb, explains. We're the nicest walkway block around Hume. It's like the yuppie block, you know. It's all been painted up. Because we have the Hume offices there, you know, like the council things. So we get spoiled. We've got, we've got no cockroaches. We get, like, painted up. We get our windows done up and things, you know. These are like the notorious crescents. These are, like, the uh, worst to live in, really. But the flats actually used to be really good inside. The funniest thing about them is that they said they were structurally unsound. We had to knock them down. They found out now they're knocking them down. They're really built really tough and they're really hard to knock down, you know. So what happened really to the area? Why did it become so run down? Well, the council ran it down. When it, when it first time it was open, like, most of the work class families managed to want to live here because they had central heating, really good flats, you know. But the council's ran it down over the years. And I, I don't, think, don't think they really thought about it that much today, you know, when they build these sort of places. I mean, these are meant to be built in shapes of the crescents and that, you know, that's yeah. why the crescent shapes. So it's really quiet round here now, it's hardly all this round here at all. Do you think you need empty urban spaces near the city centre? Well, I think yeah. you should have their cheap in city accommodation, you yeah. know. Because I, mean, I think like uh, stuff like, like rock and roll or anything, music, techno, music or anything is an inner city culture and it's not about living in villages out in Cheshire, yeah. is it, you know? Well, I mean, people aren't asking for very much, are they, you know, to live in places like this and, uh, Put a lot of back in the community as well. I mean, a lot of people do, don't they? You know. I mean, an art scene always needs a, a bohemian type of area to thrive, doesn't it? I mean, you've got like Kreuzberg and Berlin. That's dying as well now, isn't it? I mean, I've heard Amsterdam's becoming the main bohemian place in Europe now. But everyone, everyone's moving up there. It's now three o'clock, one of the first blocks in Hume to be refurbished as Hopton Court, right on the east side near the student quarter. We're going there to meet Anif Cousins and Colin Thorpe of Chapter and Verse, long-term Hume Moss Side residents who write, play and sing eloquently about their part of the city. It was a place where a lot of people, you know, could get together and, you know, and uh, play. Also, you didn't have that hassle of next-door neighbours because I think everybody was, like, a lot more easy-going around Hume. You know, they could tolerate the noise. Like I remember when I was, like, part of my exams, rock bands would set up in the, um, in the Crescents and play like it was an amphitheatre. It was ridiculous, you know. You know, so it was like Guns N' Roses concert, you know, indie band. So, but, you know, you just, that was part of Hume. That was a makeup of Hume. How did the area become to be a problem in the first place? Was the design of the buildings wrong? Was the whole planning of the area wrong? What happened? I don't know. It's part of, part of this... 50s, 60s utopian idea, wasn't it? That uh, you construct these cities in the sky, etc., etc., and the walkways and everything would be wonderful. Yeah. The British people have never lived vertically, as, as opposed to their continentals, who, uh, who don't seem to have any problem with walking up four or five you know, flights of stairs to flats. Um, doesn't seem to be a problem. I'd like to buy my flat, but I know it would be unfair to take council housing stock. <laughs> You know what I mean? But it, it, I must admit this bit, you know, I'm really fortunate to get this block. Like some of the other blocks, like Meredith, have been done up as well. And they're coming along and like they've knocked down a lot of the blocks down over there. And it, it looks better already to me. I mean, I like, I've spoke to people and they said they're, they're glad they're all going down, you know. And uh, like, you know, go around Moss Side and you see some of the new houses with 
you know, fences where you don't see your next door neighbour. People seem to enjoy that, you know. As you listen to this, try to identify with the philosophy. Ghetto is a state of mind. It's not where you live your life, but how your life is lived. Not a goth. I haven't seen a goth for ages. A mile and a half southwest of Hume lies the debtors' retreat, Chalton. It's now home to many Manchester musicians, members of the Stone Roses, M People, A Certain Ratio, and 808 States' Graham Massey. I think it's like the nearest sort of tree line place to town, really. Yeah. You know, nobody wants to be too far out of the action, which is, you know, about a mile that way. Yeah, you can imagine you're not in Manchester at the same time. You know, it's quite villagey, self-contained. So we're hearing a new world now, aren't we? I hear a new world. I hear a new world. You, you've been a musician in Manchester for how long? About 10, 15 years? Is that all 10 years? Yeah, about yeah. 10 years. How has it changed over the last 10 years? Um, well, it's become a lot more successful, I think, when in my, in my day, if you weren't, uh, in my day. It's like, you, either, you got the punk lump, yeah. and then you got the, the house lump later on, and in between is this huge desert where nobody did nothing. I think music's just become a lot more accessible, uh, you know, making it for you know, like people. You know, they can get a record out easier. They black studio time, they borrow instruments, <laughs> they don't pay for anything. And then the, the first point where you spend money is having it pressed up, having it mastered, which costs you about maybe eight hundred pounds or something. And then you sell them through record shops, you know, record shops like Eastern Block. You need, uh, you know, roots for your music, you know, and I think it just sort of drifted around for a while trying to find an identity. And we, we found it with, like, computer music. As we started, you know, listening to dance music a lot more. I think the computer thing really freed you up and allowed you to make music that you wanted to make. So and, mu and music yeah. that you could actually sort of, that had a use. Is it just a coincidence or is there any significance in the fact that the computer was invented in Manchester? Yeah, somebody told me that the other day. <laughs> I was quite shocked. I think, yeah, the computer was invented in Manchester, but I think they also invented the Luddite as well in Manchester. <laughs> so if the computer was invented, it was probably like putting a cupboard for a few years while somebody else developed it. Cars is sort of the most important place for our music. That's that's the place where we know it's, it, you know if it works in a car, it'll work everywhere. We make great travelling music. Manchester's absolutely packed full of great driving moments. This is one of them. It's got everything. GMX, Refuge Building, Town Hall. Eastgate, Knott Mill, Boardwalk, going over the River Medlock now, that's Pete Waterman's new building, the church, and the painted up bridges, the city based on transport, canals, rivers, roads, metros, trains, Every conceivable form of transport you can want. Here we are, the library, the town hall, people on their way to Prince. Yep, waiting for the trams. Here we are. I haven't run anybody over yet, but I'm sure they will soon. Altrincham to Bury, direct. On a night like this, it looks like the perfect plan of a city. This is how planners would like to see the city. Everybody's getting on the trams, it's sunny, there's enough people around, it's wonderful. Typical of the new Manchester confidence is Manto's, a mixed bar right in the heart of what's now called Manchester's Gay Village. It's the perfect pre-club mid-evening stop-off with views of the newly cleaned Rochdale Canal and the Whitworth Street Corridor. Central Manchester Development Corporation's regeneration zone right across the south of the city centre. 
Held together by the canal, the zone takes in Piccadilly Village in the east, new accommodation like India and Lancaster houses in the centre, and clubs like the Hacienda and the Boardwalk to the west. It's about nine. The time for a drive. We're going to go now to one of my favourite streets in Manchester. Best street in Manchester, this. Here's the uh, remnants of the Industrial Revolution all around us. Wonderful set for a film which hasn't been made, but not a very nice place to live. East Manchester was the heart of the Industrial Revolution. I suppose in its day it was as bad as we think of Eastern Europe now. Smog emissions, pollution, and now there's almost nothing here. So what's going to replace it? The past into the present. The Industrial Revolution into Techno City. It's 11 o'clock, Friday night. One of the two club nights of the week. Even in the recession. Next stop is the Boardwalk, just south of Whitworth Street in Knott Mill. Tonight is Dave Haslam's classic disco night, Yellow. I talked to owner Colin Sinclair at 11 o'clock, just before the club hops up. It's an old Sunday school. It was built in 1876, before any of this urban desolation you see around you was ever here. When it was built, it was surrounded by fields, playing fields. When I found it, which was some seven years ago, it was completely derelict, as, was, as really was much of the inner city. I think the boom of Manchester music owes a lot to like, the urban landscape itself and the fact that in this area there were so many derelict warehouses and derelict mills and nobody could use them for anything at all. And along would come a band that needs somewhere to practice. And unlike many other cities, Manchester had all these huge, like, empty urban cathedrals waiting for people to do something in. One of the prime sites on Whitworth Street is the Hacienda, celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. Ligon Rippveld is curator of the exhibition about the club's history. It, it changed in a way that, that a lot of the derelict spaces around here were, were done up and reused and in, 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 in new use. It's like the derelict train stations, the GMX now, and uh, the old gas factory, you know, the, the, the British Council's down there now, and some nice shops around here. The, night, the nightclubs are important because they're like a, a point of socialising and also uh, a space where to forget daily realities. And it's also a space where you sort of recharge your emotional energies, very much like a church in a way, a nighttime church. From 6 o'clock to possibly 10 o'clock on a, sun, on a Saturday night, it was, um, Thousands upon thousands of youngsters, 16, 17, younger, 15, 14, coming from the outside areas, from Bradford, from Leeds, mainly Yorkshire, coming down to Manchester, to the clubs. This was Round Trees, it's now the ex-club. Right. There's Round Trees there. Yeah. How many, do, you, do you have any idea of how many, um, how many clubs there are in Manchester at the moment? At the moment, I think there's 100, 130. In the surrounding areas, at that, at that particular time in the in, in the 60s, there was, I believe, around about 250, 300. That's taking the outskirts in again. We're just passing now the the Andale Centre, where if you see, see where the stairways in the Andale Centre, yeah. to, to the to the left of that, it was Cromford Court. And in Cromford Court, there was the Cromford Club, which was a casino. And at the side of that, there was the Jigsaw Club. And then it changed to Heaven and Hell. I saw Joe Cocker, Joe Cocker was a grease pad there, 66. Another one. This was, this was the Oasis. This is where, this is where the... <coughs> the Hall is. This is like the, the resident band here. This is how it was, it was great. Look at, look at this now. Oh, yeah. 
This is how it should be. This is life. You said before that um, in the 60s you had a really vibrant city mm. and now it's dead. What's happened? Well, it goes down to the, 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 the mass clearances in the 60s. The same thing happened in Scotland, didn't it? When they shipped everybody to Canada. You know, it's, it's just, the, the planners have these great ideas about this, this the city of the future and they take the heart of the city away. Where I live in Ancoats now, there's nothing left apart from. I think there's a set of toilets left in Ancoats. I remember when I was a kid. Everything else is gone. Yeah, but we, we, we're fast becoming a major tourist city. And, and the most embarrassing thing that can happen to you, ask any of the club owners, you, 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 you will come up against this. You get tourists who come to the bar half past, half past one in the morning, and we'll, we'll come in the club, and we're having a good time, and two o'clock comes, and it's, everything stops, and they come to the bar and they say, is there any chance to finish now? You go for a license for a club. And let, let's say we go through the motions and, and you, everything's okay. You've got, you've got your, um, the fire's been around, the police has been around, everything's been around. You bring the magistrates, right, who don't live in the city. They live in Winslow, Bramall. They might be masons. They, 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 they might like doing waltzes. Um, uh, they, they, they might like being a, a Rotarian. You know, they might like playing golf. We don't. We like, we, we like to stay awake till five in the morning. It's just our life. You know, we, we, we need that. It's different values. Allow us our values. Give us a chance. No night, probably it just goes on. And on and on and on. The old night party goes on. So it's four o'clock, everybody else is asleep except for us. We're up in Sunset Radio with Hugh and Clark, one of Manchester's best DJs, playing all night. Hugh and you're up all night. Who are you playing to? I'm not quite sure actually. Uh, I have a vision in my mind. All the people that I play to, these are people that have been listening to Black Music for a long time and they've reached a spiritual stage of it. That's the sort of music that I'm playing for them. But I believe that music is like, once you get into it, you're addicted to it. And you have to stay with it and follow it and find out more about it. And the more you try to find out about it, the more you get pulled in by the, the inspirational phase of it. Manchester's got, got a very strong underground movement. Uh, musicians. DJs, and they, they just don't get any exposure at all. And what I try to do is I try to give them that exposure on the program. You know what I mean? Can you tell me also about the recent history of black clubs in Manchester? Well, they're all white-owned. I don't. In my time span, there's never been sort of like a black-owned nightclub in Manchester. There never has been. I mean, there's an amazing amount of money waiting for the first person to do that. Uh, all the clubs we've ever had uh, to promote black music have always been like clubs that are at the end of their lease. You know what I mean? They started off as sort of like um, nightclub for the mainstream white audience or whatever. You know what I mean? Your commercial life. And clubs only last so long and then they die. And when they start to die, they lose the audience. And the managers sort of like say, well, you know, we've got six months left on this week, how can we get some money in? Why don't we let the black kids in? You know what I mean? And it's always been the same. We very rarely have a regular black music night in a high quality nightclub in Manchester. And it's so sad really. The few moments that we have had them, you know, have been very enthusiastically to see people dressed up, look nice and come out. And it's just sad. And I'd like to, uh, I think that's one of my ambitions, actually, to work in my own I want to be rich, and I want to keep my to spend the time with it. But it's, uh, it's just difficult to get in there,
now six in the morning. The city's still asleep, but the day's just beginning at the airport. It's the only place to go to listen to the stone roses and watch the planes take off for Larnaca and Ibiza. Now you can fly direct to New York. 100 years ago, you'd go to the Castlefield Basin and you'd buy your ticket to America from this tiny booth. This transportation theme park is now a major area of regeneration. The Whitley Street Corridor is a fascinating uh, regeneration corridor for Manchester, really. Uh, what's happened is that in 1987, the Development Corporation were designated and they have actively stimulated redevelopment in this sort of urban fringe of Manchester. So can you tell me how important would you say for the city um, has its pop culture been? It's been integral in, to my mind. An integral, it's had an integral influence on the economy which has never really been recognised by the mainstream economy in Manchester. And it's only now, now that uh, Manchester music has become very established on, on an international scale that the establishment is coming around to that way of thinking. To my mind, the, the best developments are those that take time. That it's, it's sort of organic regeneration it, and it's, it's an evolutionary development pace rather than a revolutionary development pace. It's very difficult to use a contemporary environment within a historic setting, but when it's w used well, it actually works fantastically. One person investing in the area is record producer Pete Waterman. It was um, a church, and it's built in two levels for two reasons. The plebs went downstairs and the hierarchy went upstairs. You know, if you worked for the Lord, you went downstairs, but if you were the Lord, you were allowed to go upstairs. Where it's going to be studios and uh, office offices. You know, we've just started our own label out of Manchester, so we're running the lot. This, this office here is a design team and they do all the sleeves, not just for us, but a lot of other people. Um, so it, it'll be like a grand record company, like a, a Manchester EMI. If you look at history, the North West has probably been the most prolific uh, spawner of talent, musically and probably artistically, that, that there is. There's something about London that is not quite as artistic as the North West, probably because it's all there for you and you don't have to make it where in this part of the world, you have to make the entertainment yourself. Manchester's always been a big, big, big dance area. I mean, particularly black dance area. And I think that, I mean, I came here originally, started to come here purely because of the dance culture. Because I related more to the dance scene here than I did in London. Because we're a little bit faster with our rhythms up here. And there are rumours that Radio 1 is going to move to, to Manchester. There's a very strong possibility that Top of the Pops will move to Manchester. If it does, then that one move of Radio 1 to Manchester will change completely the record industry because there'll be no need to be in London. You know, you can fax uh, Tokyo from here, you can fax New York from here, you can phone anywhere in the world. So it doesn't matter, uh, you know, where you are. And a 35-minute shuttle flight from Manchester gets anybody from any part of the world. And, of course, we've got flights into Manchester now from Tokyo, so it's an open world, really. As if we compete in Manchester against uh, Londoners and against... New Yorkers and, you know, Europeans, we'll beat them. We'll beat them because we've got all the raw talent. But we have to do it commercially. It has to be that you, you've got to make a hit. You know, just because you're in Manchester, you know, you're not, I'm not going to give you money just to be in Manchester. Get off your fat ass and go and kill them. Manchester, home of the Industrial Revolution, is now poised to enter a new golden age. As the inner city is regenerated, the city comes to life again with the sound of industry replaced by the sound of music. The music which gives the city its identity. Tomorrow, a celebration goes out on the town in Blackpool at the same time, 10.40. Ah, my favourite!